Oh, here on this. Welcome, everybody. <laughs> um, we're going to take a, a few minutes, like we usually do, to start our meeting with a brief meditation. And so, if you're, uh, if you have things on your lap, you might want to put them somewhere else and get yourself a place that you can totally relax, um, and let yourself go go to that place where you go when you go and let your eyes gently close and allow the energy to flow through you. Welcome back. So, wow. Amazing times, amazing situations. Bottom line, I think we're all headed towards better things. And I think that's what, what we need to hold in our hearts as we move forward. So um, I feel so blessed that I ha got to meet Brian Clark. Uh, and uh, he, my guides always bring these people to me. <laughs> and I call him and he's such a lovely person and uh, his story is so dramatic. Uh, I I run my whole life by uh, listening and trusting, listening to what I hear and trusting what I, I feel to be true, and I I I have wonderful guides and they're there with me all the time, and um, I was it's just so amazing how everything kind of falls together. I just am constantly in a state of awe. So um, I, um, my guy, my life is very guided and things happen, you know, not just 
and finding the right speakers for the for the organization. Uh, last month, I mentioned we we had no speaker beyond December. Now we're booked through March. Um, Adam Teipel, who ran the summit yesterday, which was wonderful, by the way. If you didn't go to it, he's going to do more. And you want to uh, I'll put notifications in our monthly email, follow up on it, go to his website. He's got great stuff going to happen. Yesterday was great fun and wonderful, a wonderful happening in, in every way. It went from in the Chicago, it went from 11 o'clock in the morning until seven o'clock at night, all day, every 45 minutes, a different fabulous speaker. And it was worth every, every minute. It was excellent. Well, except I, I, I was one of them, so I don't want to talk about me, but, uh, but it was very special. And um, so he'll be our speaker. He had a near-death experience when he was a little boy, and he's going to talk about how that changed his life and propelled him to do the things he's doing today. He's 48 now, and he's very active, and in, in, uh, he's been a re reconnective practitioner with Eric Pearl for 20 years, and and he's very much into energy of all kinds and it's it's wonderful. And he'll be our speaker in January. And I wanted to mention um, in February, our speaker will be Sonia Choquette's daughter, Sonia Tully. And it, it was wonderful to catch up with her again. She's now 33, I believe. And um, she and her sister are both extremely intuitive and they're practicing psychics. Uh, Sonia is in New Orleans and her sister Sabrina is in the UK. So um, as I said, they're both excellent uh, intuitive practitioners and spiritual teachers. And uh, she's going to talk to us about what it's like growing up in a family that is so connected to the other side because uh, of course, Sonia and her and Sonia's mother, Sonia, were very, very intuitive, and everything that they did from the time they were born was with that in mind. And she's going to talk to us about what that was like in February. And um, in March, uh, Diane Goebbels will be our speaker. I tried to get her for a speaker a couple of years ago, and she's in her 80s now. And she said she didn't travel anymore, but when we're now having them online, she can come. So she's going to talk to us about her experiences. She's written four books. So things are filling up again. So um, we have some good things to look forward to, especially today because we have Brian with us. And I'm not gonna do a long introduction other than to say he's originally from Canada and, and he was up in the in Tower Two, when the World Trade Center was hit, and this uh, the thing that's so important to me about his experience is especially important is how beautifully he listened to the messages he got from the other side. Um, we all get messages from the other side every day, but most of us don't pay any attention because we've been raised to think that they don't really mean anything or that they're not real. And that's nothing could be farther from the truth. And his experience is proof that that's what I just said is true. So please give a warm welcome to Brian Clark. It's all yours, Brian. If you have questions, please write them on the chat. Thank you, Diane, and hello to you all. Um, I'll, I'll start by, I guess my caveat is that um, that particular day to which Diane referred I, I didn't die at any time. So technically I didn't have a near death experience. <clears throat> I was near death, but it was those other people all around me that sadly died that day. Um, but I didn't experience that. So with that little caveat out of the way, I will go back to a time long before 9-11. I just, my first experience if you like, with something that I couldn't explain um, was the following. I am an only child and I was born into a, a family with a natural father and mother, but also my mother's mother. So my grandmother was living with my parents 
when I was born. I became the fourth member of the household, if you like. And um, I lived with my grandmother all the way up until, uh, I guess, around my 16th birthday when my grandmother, who I called Mammer, that's when I was asked to say the word grandmother, the, the, the word that came out of my mouth was Mammer, and she was Mammer to everybody, including her daughter, my mother, um, and all of my grandmother's friends. Everybody called her Mammer. All my friends called her Mammer. They knew her. She was quite vivacious, but uh, around my 16th birthday, she developed uh, some form of dementia. I don't remember the word Alzheimer's being spoken that many years ago, but uh, after my mother did her best to look after her mother, my mammer, um, at our home, it was decided by my parents that she should put, be put into a, a, an institution of sorts. And uh, my mother for the next two years was very faithful in visiting mammer um, at least two or three times a week. And that would involve in Toronto, a, you know, a, a bus ride and then maybe a streetcar ride. And, and it was a, at least a half hour trip each way, but she would do this several times a week. After this two year period of, of Mammer, and, and I very rarely visited her because, you know, she couldn't really converse. She didn't know who I was and so on. So in a way, at, as, a, as a 16, 17, and then 18 year old, what's the point? You know, why, why am I doing this? Our minister, finally convinced my mother that she needed to take a vacation. And my father's name was Harold. And, and uh, the minister said, Mary, my mother, um, you and Harold and Brian need to take a vacation. Well, after a week of impressing the issue, uh, my mother finally relented and said, okay, we'll, we'll, we'll take a week off. And uh, the minister said, uh, you know, we'll look after Mammer, because he certainly called her Mammer. We'll look after Mammer, you know, while you're gone, I'll visit and so on. So to my, my family decided, my mother and dad decided, well, we'll go to St. Louis for a week. This is from Toronto because former, former neighbors uh, had moved to St. Louis and they missed them and that would be a good thing to go visit them. So the night before we left, we went to the hospital where my grandmother was and uh, I sort of tagged along and we, we spent half an hour with her at her bedside and she would just was lying back and would mumble a few things. Um, but my mother was very intent on talking to her and saying what we were going to do for the next few days and blah, blah, blah. And it was time to leave. So as luck would have it, my parents were leading me out of the room and uh, I heard something behind me, a, 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 a sound, a voice, if you like. <clears throat> and I turned around and went back to my grandmother's bed and I, I sort of leaned in a bit and she was just lying there mumbling a bit. I said, did you say something, Mammer? And when I said that to her, she sat right up in bed, up on one elbow, opened her eyes, looked at me, and she said directly to me, she said, God bless you, Brian. And then slumped back into her bed and began mumbling again. And I said, well, God bless you too, Bammer. And I went out of the room somewhat dumbfounded or, or confused, if you like, and into the hallway and off we went. The next day we drove to St. Louis. And sure enough, the day after that, our minister called and said, Mary, I'm really sorry, but your mother died last night. So we immediately got in the car and returned to Toronto from our vacation in St. Louis after two days. And what proceeded with the, you know, the funeral and burial and so on of my grandmother. So I'm just telling you all that because that was a, a thing that has stuck in my mind for a long time, for the rest of my life, really, as a, as a confused conversation, if you like, that didn't, that seemed supernatural, didn't, didn't make sense at the time. That was, as I say, a first experience. Now we'll go to the 9-11 story, which some of you I'm sure have heard or, or read about. My particular um, instance was, was the following, and this will take a little while if you haven't heard it. Um, I lived in a bedroom community of New York City uh, in a town called Mawa, northwest of Manhattan. And we had moved there in 1974 and I did a daily commute, riding my, taking my car to a train station in Glen Rock, New Jersey, 
and then a train ride to Hoboken, New Jersey, and then a subway ride on something called the Path Train, the Port Authority Trans Hudson train that goes from Hoboken under the Hudson River into the basement of the World Trade Center. In the Trade Center, you'd come up a long escalator up to the indoor shopping area that was sort of central to this 16 acre site. That's how big the Trade Center site was, 16 acres. And I would find my way to Two World Trade Center, which was the South Tower, um, and ride an express elevator from the lobby to the 78th floor, cross this lobby, and find a local elevator up to the 84th floor, which is where our office is. We, our company called Euro Brokers, uh, occupied the entire 84th floor of the South Tower. It may be helpful if you understand the layout of the 16 acre site. Each of the towers was 208 feet by 208 feet or about an acre in size. And the layout of those two towers, which is helpful in the story if you understand it. Um, I always tell people just imagine a three by three grid and in your mind label those boxes if you like, one, two, three across the top and then four, five, six through the middle seven, eight, nine at the bottom. And now place the North Tower in box number one and the South Tower in box number eight. So although they were offset, it wasn't on a 45 degree angle, but you can picture a building in box one and the South Tower in box number eight. So there I am. And, oh, and my office, my personal office was in the Southwest corner of that box number eight. So on 9-11, I did my normal commute. I arrived at the office uh, on the 84th floor at, the, at our whole floor, if you like, um, at about 7.15 in the morning. And I, was, I walked around the trading floor. We were a small brokerage firm. Our products were capital markets. We screamed and yelled at each other on telephones uh, on a trading floor. And our customers were the large financial institutions, global institutions because we had offices in uh, London and Tokyo and other places around the globe. Um, so our customers, if you can think of banks like Wells Fargo or Bank of America, Citibank, Goldman Sachs in North America, and then Barclays in London and Societe Generale in Paris, those sorts of customers. So it was big, big professional money. The company got paid a tiny commission per million dollars per day, we got paid 50 cents. So a hundred million dollar transaction from today till tomorrow, we would bill each customer on a hundred million dollar transaction, just $50. I mean, it was, it was high volume. You, you, the public generally doesn't understand what we do or what we did. Nonetheless, we loved it. It was fun, it was high pressure, but if you thrive on that, you enjoyed going to work every morning. I certainly did. Now I was now in night by 2001, I was a dinosaur. I had joined the company in 1974 and it's a young person's game, but I was now one of the managers, if you like. I had played the game, I understood the game, but I was too old to really be doing it. If, if you think of a baseball team or professional sporting team, the manager typically has played the game, but he's no longer in the game, but he makes the decisions as to who should be playing, what position and so on. So that was kind of one of the roles I filled. Went once around the trading floor on, the, on my arrival that day and everything seemed to be operating well. So I went back to my office to start working on spreadsheets or emails or whatever at about 8.30. And 15 minutes later, I was sitting typing at my keyboard in the Southwest corner of the, of the tower two, the box number eight. Uh, when at 8.46, there was this loud Boom, boom, a double explosion. And I, my head jerked upward because the lights buzzed above me. Um, and you know, what was that? And then my peripheral vision caught something behind me and I just spun around in my chair and against the glass on the west wall of the South Tower, right against the glass, 84 floors in the air, swirling flames right against the glass, a bright glare. It dissipated after two or three seconds and out in the airspace, 84 floors in the air, papers, just singed papers washing in the air. A, a, a sort of a strange sight, what the heck is this? What I thought had happened incorrectly, this isn't what happened, but what I thought had happened was that a construction worker, maybe up on the 86th floor, 85th floor above me, 
had hit a gas line, a, a welder had hit a gas line and the explosion or the flames had spilled out the building and, and fell past my window. That's not what happened. What had happened at 846 was that the North Tower was hit on the North Wall. So in box number one, imagine the, the, the plane hitting the North Wall on the North side at about the 93rd floor. And the flames washed right through that building out the south side of that building through boxes uh, four and seven. And, and box seven is outside my window, if you like. Um, and those were the flames that I saw for those two or three seconds. Um, I, I jumped up and I grabbed the a flashlight that I had been given by the World Trade Center. I had become one of the volunteer fire marshals on our floor after the 93 bombing in the basement. They had asked executives to volunteer to do this because if the boss says stay or go, typically people will you know, pay attention. With no disrespect to mailroom boys or receptionists, if they are in charge of an evacuation, people tend to not pay attention to somebody lower down the ladder, so to speak. Um, but anyway, I had volunteered for this. They'd given us some good training. We did drills every six months and so on. And one of the things they gave me was a whistle that I put around my neck and a, and a bright red cap and a reflective vest and so on. And I went out with holding my flashlight out of the office and I told everybody in that Southwest quadrant of our building to go to the center corridor and await further instructions. That's what we had been told to do. Well, there were a lot of people not paying attention to what I had to say either. And they just made a beeline for the elevators and the stairs and were starting to exit the building, which in, in retrospect or in hindsight was a good thing that was happening at that moment. Um, our tower had not been hit at this point. I walked onto our trading floor and up toward the north windows, there were a bunch of people standing at those windows, looking up and to their left, up and to the northwest, just nine floors up to the 93rd floor of the building next door. And right around on the 93rd floor was this huge ring of fire. And there, all the TV sets in our trading floor that were normally attuned to financial stations were now watching the same thing that anybody in Stockholm or Hong Kong or Schenectady um, were watching on TV, that long range vision from Midtown of, of the North Tower with some fire on the 93rd floor. Um, we could see it up close and personal, obviously. There, I had heard, and this is now maybe five to nine by the time I got there, I had heard that people were jumping and that was something I did not want to see. So I didn't press my nose against the glass to look up. But one of the women, uh, co-worker, a uh, Susan Polio, has saw somebody jump and she turned around and she ran back to me two or three yards and she said, oh, Brian, in tears, she said, Brian, people are dying. And I said, Susan, I know it's a terrible thing. Come on, let's get you a little more composed. And I walked her back to the center core and the corridor and I left her in the ladies room and I continued on back to my office and I phoned my wife in Northern New Jersey and I told her, uh, turn on the television set. Something's happened next door, but I want you to know we're okay. I called my father in Toronto and told him, Dad, turn on the TV, you know, blah, 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 and, and hung up the phone. As I put the phone down at now nine o'clock, um, uh, the public address system, uh, the fellow who had actually run all our uh, fire safety drills over the past several years, his voice came over the public address system and said, your attention, ladies and gentlemen, building two is secure. In other words, the South Tower is secure. There is no need to evacuate building two. If you are in the middle of evacuation, you may use the re-entry doors and the elevators to return to your office. Repeat, building two is secure. And he went through the whole paragraph again. Well, I put down the, you know, the phone and, and or, uh, took a sigh of relief saying, okay, we're, we're okay here, went out of my office carrying my flashlight. And um, I came nose to nose on the west side of the building, fortunately, the west side of the building with a coworker, Bobby Call, C-O-L-L. -L. And I said, Bobby, what, what have you heard? What's going on? And he said, well, I've been, I was down the stairs and I heard the announcement to come back to the office. And while he was telling me this, it's now 9.03, that loud boom, boom happened again. Only this time it was our building that got hit. And we were hit with a second plane at about the 78th, 79th floor. So 
a few floors below me um, on the south wall. Now, fortunately, the right wingtip was up and it went through the east side of our trading floor on the 84th floor, but the left wingtip was lower and probably went through the west side of our building on about the 70, I'm going to say the 74th, 73rd, 74th floor. So because I was standing on the west side of our building, I was not at that instant in any danger. But I will tell you what happened, and it all happened in a split second. The entire room fell apart. There's not a better explanation. Everything rained out of the ceiling. The ceiling grid, of course, collapsed, but air conditioning ducts, lights, speakers, everything just rained down on Bobby Call and, and me. And he and I immediately went into like a middle linebacker uh, athletic get ready stance, you know, to sort of gain our balance and protect ourselves from everything coming out of the ceiling. As a brokerage firm, everything was on a raised floor, six inch pedestals, two by two concrete tiles up on these pedestals. All of that went out of square. I saw a, a wall tear at a jagged angle. All the filing cabinets were disrupted, falling over, collapsing. It was just, it was as if you gave a demolition crew um, sledgehammers and pickaxes and everything and gave them a week to destroy the room, but it all happened in a split second. The air was filled with construction dust. There was no flames, no black smoke from, from fire, or anything like that, just this gritty construction dust. Electricity off, um, light streaming and sunlight streaming in from the windows, but, but just this darkness. And then, for, and this is all, that all happened in one second. And then for the next 10 seconds was the only time in the day that I was afraid, that I felt like I wasn't in control of events. Because for five seconds, the first five of those 10 seconds, whether this happened or not, I don't know, but the sensation was that the whole building swayed six to eight feet. I know that sounds extraordinary. It felt like it was swaying to the west, that it was going to fall over, if you like. Six to eight feet, it went to the west. It stopped. And for five seconds, it slowly came back to vertical. And there was this loud creaking noise as the, then the steel went into square and there was sort of this noticeable hop. And then I'm to the point where I can tell you the first time I felt something odd happen. Yes, it was odd to be hit, uh, hit by terrorists, but something that I wasn't aware of, this feeling just washed over me, not a voice, but just this feeling, Brian, you're going to be fine. You're going to be all right. Well, that was so reassuring that I felt, ah, seconds ago, I was terrified. Now I'm fine. I ca calmly reached in my pocket for the flashlight, turned it on, shone it around this gritty, dusty room, chalky atmosphere, if you like. And I led Bobby Call and five or six other people out of that west side trading floor into the hallway. Can, if you can imagine that the hallway was, was really two hallways, east, west, and north, south. So think of it as four hallways, if you like. In the western portion that I started down, there was no fire escape. The fire escapes were in the other three sections. As I got to that intersection, fully intending to turn to the right to stairway C, and stairway B was straight ahead of me in the other hallway, and stairway A was to my left, as I got to that intersection, almost starting to make the turn to the right to stairway C, there was this strong push on my right shoulder. Nobody there, but this push on my shoulder that I should go to the left to stairway A. So I went with it. I didn't fight it. I just went with it. I went to stairway A and started down the stairs. So I can't explain that, but that, that's what happened. So the stairs be between each flight was a this way and a that way, this way, that way, you know, sort of double stairs between each flight. So from the 84th to the 83rd, to the 82nd, to the 81st, and as I stepped onto the 81st floor landing with this group of people following me, me with my flashlight, coming up the stairs, I was stopped by a large woman and a, by comparison, a rather frail gentleman, the coworker of hers, 
And the woman just stopped. She, she got in my way. No, no, you can't go down. And everybody kind of went bump, bump, bump in beside me on the landing or behind me. So now there's this group of almost 10 people on this little landing and she would not let anybody pass. No, she said, you cannot go down. There's, there's flames and smoke below. We've got to go higher. We've got to get fresh air. And in the midst of this debate, me with my flashlight sort of shining it in the face of whoever wanted to speak, and, and should we go up, should we go down? What are you talking about lady and so on? I was distracted. I heard this boom, 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 this knocking noise inside the 81st floor and this rather muffled cry for help. Help, help, I'm buried, is anyone there? I can't breathe. And I sort of had to focus on it and listen. Ah, okay, somebody's in there and they need help. And I just, by randomness, grabbed the shoulder of the person beside me, a coworker of mine, Ron DeFrancesco, and I said, come on, Ron, we've got to get this guy. You know, I felt like I needed some assistance. Um, the door was locked, but the whole door frame had blown off the wall, and I was able to push the drywall back and then slide sideways through this gap in the wall between the drywall and the frame. And I have this very clear memory of all my coworkers, plus the heavy set woman and her coworker, turning around and starting up the stairs led by one of my fire safety team members, uh, David Vera, who was carrying a walkie-talkie. Um, he was a technologist in our company and our technology team was on our fire safety team because they use these walkie-talkies in their daily task of connecting a phone line on turret number 73 and the other person would be in the phone room, you know, deep in the center of the core um, and they could talk to each other on the walkie-talkie making sure that they were connecting the right line to the right turret, you know, of all our customers. So in I went, but I have this vision of these people going up the stairs. And of course, they all died that day. But I'm in on the 81st floor now with Ron Francesco, And it's very dark in there, much more black smoke. Again, no flames yet, but lots of black smoke on that floor. And again, total destruction, almost worse than our floor because it was closer to the impact zone. Now, I still don't know for certain what has happened. I knew the moment we were hit that it was terrorism, but I didn't know what it was. I, I knew no knowledge of airplanes or anything like that at that point. But in we go, and this stranger's voice is saying, no, no, to your left, no more to your, okay, come this way. And we're getting closer and closer. And I'm guessing from the doorway to the stranger was about 20 yards. Halfway there, Ron, right beside me, shoulder to shoulder, was completely overcome with the smoke. He was <laughs> coughing, sputtering. He couldn't breathe. He had a gym bag with him and he was trying to use it to filter the air somehow, but that wasn't working and just coughing and sputtering. He turned around and he went back to the stairs and he left me alone. And I had this other moment that I can describe to you that I can't explain, but I almost, I, I remember it was almost like an out of body experience where I was looking at myself and, and it all happened in like two seconds. It takes me longer to describe it. Around me was this bubble of fresh air, almost like being a, in a deep sea diver's helmet, if you like, fresh air and I'm breathing normally. And yet Ron is sputtering, can't breathe. And all this smoke is swirling all around me, but fresh air right around me. How strange I thought to myself. And then I kind of sobered up, if you like, and, and realized I still had some work to do. And with my flashlight, I kept moving toward this stranger's voice. As I got close to this person, he said, can you see my hand? Can you see my hand? And down near the floor was this hand sticking through the hole in the wall, waving up and down. And I suddenly saw the hand. I focused on it. And then I moved the light up his arm through this hole in the wall where his arm was sticking into this person's beady eyes on the other side of this wall. And this person said, hallelujah, I've been saved. One thing I gotta know, do you know Jesus Christ? And rather like Peter in denial, I stammered out a very, uh, uh, I, I go to church every Sunday. That, that was the best I could do to this thing. I didn't wanna get into a theological discussion at that point. Um, and I said, come on, we got work to do here. You know, and he slid his arm back through this hole in the wall. I removed a lot of debris from my side of this wall. And, and I haven't seen this stranger again yet, but he's working on the other side. But this wall was just immovable. We couldn't break through it. So I went a 
couple of yards off to the side. I grabbed the desk and I dragged it over, tipped it up on its end and climbed up on it. And I'm now standing on the end of this desk, but looking over the wall because the, all the walls just go up to nine feet and stop and they drop the ceiling to that level. So it looks like a, a sealed room, if you like, but there's really lots of space above these ceiling tiles. And that's all gone now, it's on the floor. But I can look over this wall to see this stranger the other side. And I said, the only way out of there is for you to come up this wall. And he, I said, I'll catch you, I'll do my best. And he jumped once and I missed him. He jumped a second time and I grabbed hold of something, heaved him up and over the wall. And then the desk tipped over and back we went fell on a pile of debris and he landed on top of me, gave me this great big kiss in appreciation. And I kind of stood up dusting myself off and I stuck my hand out. I said, I'm Brian Clark. He said, I'm Stanley Premnath. He said, we'll be brothers for life. And I said, well, I don't have any siblings. I said, okay, we, we can be brothers for life. And at that moment, I noticed I had a puncture wound on my right palm. He had a puncture wound on one of his palms from removing debris. And I said, in fact, we'll be blood brothers for life. And I'm the one, I confess, did it. I smushed our hands together. So Stanley Prameth and I are now blood brothers um, and will be for life. And I know that's not the thing you do in this day and age, but that was my instinct at the time. Now, Stanley Prameth and I do not look like brothers. He is an Asian Indian, rather dark skinned. And uh, he uh, was born and raised in Guyana in South America and moved to America as a, as a youngster. Um, but he and I, uh, <laughs> that's how we met. And I said, now, come on, we got let's get out of here. And with my flashlight, we made our way back to the stairs. And that's, I guess, at the moment that the fateful decision was I took that first step down into the, the darkness and the debris where this woman had come from saying there's flames and smoke. But we went down another floor and then we did have to start to dig through debris. As we passed the, maybe the 78th floor, which is the sky lobby that I referred to when I rode the express, the 78, as we passed that floor, it was a little warmer. There were flames licking through the cracks in the, in the wall like that, but not a roaring inferno. But we dug and we dug and we got through and about the 74th floor, we broke into normal conditions, basically. The lights were on suddenly and fresh air I sensed was coming from below. And again, that feeling washed over me, Brian, you're going to be fine. Well, this is good news. Okay, <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll accept that. And on we went digging. On the, the stairway was empty. We, yes, we passed the, the, the woman on the 81st floor, but there was nobody else in the stairways. In our entire descent, nobody overtook us. We didn't overtake anybody else. It was just Stanley and I in the stairway. One exception, on the 68th floor, walking up the stairs, a coworker of mine, Jose Marrero. Jose also carrying a walkie talkie. He was on our technology team. And I said to him as he approached us coming up the stairs, I said, Jose, you know, what are you doing? Where are you going? He said, I can hear Dave Vera up above on the walkie talkie. He's helping people. I'm going up to help him. I said, well, he's a, he's a big boy. He, you know, he'll, he didn't get himself out of there. He said, no, no, I'll be fine. I'll, I'll go up. And so up, up, up he went. I made the excuse that I'm getting this fellow from Fuji Bank out. And he said, okay, I'll be fine. So Jose disappeared up the stairs and, and Jose died that day. My, one of my heroes in the, in the day. Stanley and I continued on down. Our, our first stop was on the 44th floor, which is the lower of the two sky lobbies. There's two places where you can change from express elevators to, to local elevators. And in the middle of that 80, 44th floor was a security desk. And Stanley, when I, I went in there to get more information and the security desk fellow jumped up. He said, do you have phones? We said, no, we don't have telephones. He said, well, you must get a phone as soon as you can and make a phone call, he said, and get a medic and a stretcher up here because I'll look after this guy. And behind his desk was a, a male who had massive head injuries and back injuries. How he got those injuries, how he got to the 44th floor, I don't know. But the security guard was you know, on duty doing his, his good thing to stay with this gentleman. Um, and we said, okay, we'll do our best. And back to the stairs we went, down, down, down. 
Years earlier, our company had occupied the 31st floor and I knew that it was a re-entry door. So I thought, well, we can go in there and make phone calls maybe. So it was now Oppenheimer's space. I felt the doorway for heat, no flames, opened the door and in we went, completely evacuated, Oppenheimer's space, completely evacuated. And we found their conference room and picked up a phone and got dial tone. Now that's rather strange, I think, but nonetheless, there it was provided for us, if you like, dial tone on the 31st floor and yet the security guard's phone doesn't work on the 44th floor, strange stuff. I called my wife at home. I told her that uh, where I was and I got a great story to tell her um, and we're okay and I'm on my way home and that sort of thing because she had turned on the TV as I suggested at five minutes to nine and right where I telephoned from uh, just five minutes later, boom, she saw this explosion. So she thought I had died perhaps at that time. <clears throat> Our home filled up with people as a result of that, knowing that Brian worked at the World Trade Center. Um, there was probably 20 extra people in our home. Uh, three of our four children were in the area. They came back, but also some neighbors, some people from our church and so on had come to our home to be supportive of my wife. And when I called, my wife picked up the phone and I told her the story and she put down the phone, her end, turned around and told everybody at now it's now 25 minutes to 10, um, about half an hour after our tower had been hit. And she turned around and she said, Brian's okay, he's on the 31st floor. He's okay, he's got a good story to tell us and he'll be out of the building in two hours. Now, I didn't say that, but she remembered from 1993 that it had taken me two hours to get out from the 31st floor because on that occasion, when the bomb went off in the basement, everybody went to the stairway. It was completely jammed and from the 31st floor, it took two hours to get out. So the coincidence that I'm calling from 31 made her remember. So Brian will be out of the building in two hours. Now, you may not know this, but our building collapsed in 25 minutes from that point. So Stanley and I are back to the, oh, sorry. Stanley called his wife at her workplace, missed her, but left a message. And I called the 911 emergency number to tell them about the man on 44 and the injuries, get a medic, get a stretcher. And the first person on the 911 emergency number listened to my story and then they said, well, just a minute, I'm gonna connect you directly to so-and-so. Click, and I'm on hold. I wait, I wait. 15 seconds later, another voice comes on and I tell them the same spiel and they say, well, let me connect you to so-and-so. Click. So now I'm waiting for the, this third person to come on. And I waited and I waited. And then the third person came on and I said, I'm only going to tell you this once and then I'm going to hang up the phone. Here's the information that I know. And I told them about the man 44 and so on. And I said, okay, I'm going to go now. And I put the phone down. I'm going to leap ahead in the story and tell you that months later, a lawyer from the 9-11 commission came to my office and interviewed me. In fact, she came back three times on the third visit to my office. She said, would you like to hear your conversation? And with her little cassette recorder, I heard my 911 uh, emergency call number on 911. And I was actually on the 911 call for three minutes and 17 seconds. So valuable time, but I didn't know what was about to happen. Back to the stairs, Stanley and I go down, down, down. We got to the, the plaza level, it's called. There were really two lobby levels in the Trade Center complex. One was sort of access to the outdoors a plaza level, and then below that was a lobby level that was access to the indoor shopping area of the 16 acres. So at the plaza level, Stanley and I stopped, looked out into the big courtyard into, I'll call it box five, if you like, of that original description. And it's normally a, a people place full of tourists, business people coming and going, uh, you know, flowers around the fountain, vendors with their colorful, col colorful carts, um, but now it's ashen gray and, and it looked like an abandoned archeological site. My mind was somehow covered or protected in that I saw no carnage. I have no recollection of seeing bodies. And I'm told with all these people jumping and plane parts and so on, there was lots of carnage to be seen, but I have no memory whatever, what, whatsoever of that. 
We then went down an escalator behind us, um, power off, of course. At the bottom of the escalator, a female security guard or policewoman, not sure which, uh, said, now you can't go out the door here, fellas. You've got to go through the shopping area and down the hall to the southeast corner of the complex. And yeah, we nodded and went through the revolving doors and walked rather casually to that southeast corner. Firemen were casually putting on their gear and oxygen tanks and so on. But there was no sense of panic whatsoever in this lower of the two lobbies. Got to the southeast door and as I was about to go out, a fireman said, oh, hold guys, if you can't go out here, if you're going to leave this way, you've got to go for it. I said, what do you mean? He said, well, there's lots of debris falling from above. I said, well, should I look up? And he said, no, no, just go for it. Well, I couldn't do that. I, I mean, I just, that <laughs> wasn't the right thing to do. So I kind of opened the door and, you know, gave a glance up and I said, I don't see anything, Stanley. Are you ready? He says, yep. I said, all right, let's go. And we ran for a, a, a good block and a half, jumping over all sorts of debris outside past fire trucks and all sorts of stuff and debris everywhere. There's one picture that I only saw about three months ago uh, that was a, a random photo that somebody found of me running uh, through this debris. So I, I have that in, in my uh, files at home. Um, we ran, as I say, a block and a half, stopped outside a deli where, uh, in fact, along that street south of the Trade Center, all the shop owners were in their doorways, but they were protecting themselves from anything falling. And they were just sort of looking up at the burning buildings. And it was like being in the, in the New York City Marathon. As we ran by, we were, go, go, go. They were cheering us as we went. But as I ran out of gas at this deli, I stopped. They said, do you have any, any water? I said, we just come down 80 some odd floors. He said, yeah. He went back in his shop and he came back with a couple of bottles of water. He said, oh, wait, wait right here. And he went back and he came out, of the, out again with this round, rather, you know, pizza-sized, uh, breakfast platter, sliced uh, melons, uh, wetness, and, and sweet rolls, and so on, under the cellophane. And he said, nobody's coming for this today. Here, take this. So I said, okay. So I grabbed this thing and start walking down the street. We came upon two priests uh, outside the backside of Trinity Church, if you know the layout of lower Manhattan. And Stanley broke down, and he said, this man saved my life. Now, the two towers are still standing, and and so there's, in my mind, there's been no death yet, really. Um, this man saved my life. And I said, well, Stanley, maybe you, maybe you calling in on the 81st floor, maybe that saved my life. And, and one of the priests said, well, let's have a prayer. So there was a brief prayer that they'd stopped all traffic. We're out in the middle of the, the road. And, and then the other priest said at the end of the prayer, he said, uh, uh, Trinity Church is open, you know, if you'd like to go in there. Well, other than the theological discussion that Stanley and I didn't have uh, on the 81st floor, uh, we kind of eyeballed each other and said, okay, that'll be a good idea. And we started to make our way to the Trinity Church entrance, which is on Broadway. To get there, we had to walk on the south side of Trinity Church, which is a, a, a strong upward sloping street. And, and we started at the bottom, but as you move up the street, you get above the cemetery, and we were able to turn around and Stanley turned around more than 90 degrees and looked back at the South Tower, which was actually blocking the view of the North Tower from that angle. And he said, you know, I think that tower could come down. I said, there's no way, that's a steel structure. That's just carpets and furniture and drapery burning. And I didn't really get that sentence out of my lips when way up at the top, we saw this little wiggle and then boom, 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 floor by floor, it pancaked down. And it was like we were invited to watch. Very strange. The whole building dissolved in 10 seconds. We could not see the bottom quarter, I'll say, of, of the building collapsing because Trinity Church blocked our view. But Trinity Church helped us because the white wave of, of horrible guck that came out of that building as it collapsed, slammed into Trinity Church, much like a wave hitting a seawall, and the energy exploded it upward. So above us was this huge white cloud, but we're in this big, big bubble of fresh air at this point, realizing that it's going to fall down on us. We ran 30 yards up the broad Broadway, turned right, and ran down Broadway as that whole wave collapsed behind us and rolled up to our backside at the moment we got to randomly at 42 Broadway. And I went into that building 
totally, I'd never been in that building before. I didn't, almost didn't know quite where I was. And your mind does very strange things under stress because as I went through those revolving doors at 42 Broadway, I was still carrying the breakfast platter. So you do strange things when your, your mind is under some pressure. I didn't want to litter on Broadway for heaven's sake. So in we went, but guess what? This, this platter I put up on the reception desk there with 20, 25 other strangers, and we were all provided wetness, uh, sweetness, and in, in this time of trouble. It got very dark outside, and yeah, da, 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 everybody's telling their stories, and Stanley began to tell me his story about the airplane that he was looking out the south windows as this plane banked over the over the Statue of Liberty and approached. And he was mesmerized as it got closer and closer to him. And at the last minute, he just dove under his desk and said, Lord, I'm in your hands. And boom, the, his floor exploded even more than mine because he was three floors closer, or yeah, three floors closer to the explosion. Um, he and I shared stories. He gave me his personal business card. He and his wife ran a business at home, uh, Frocks for Tots, I think it was called. And I, I, I tucked it in my shirt pocket and it had his home number and home address on it and his wife's name. And we talked and then we went out the back of 42 Broadway at about quarter to 11, 15 minutes earlier, in other words, at 1030, the North Tower collapsed. We didn't know that. Got very dark outside again, so something had happened. But we went out the back of that 42 Broadway, which is also behind the New York Stock Exchange, and went around the stock exchange onto Broad Street. And on Broad Street, which is truly a broad street, it looked like winter had come. There was half an inch of snow everywhere on parking meters, on, on cars, on mailboxes, on whatever. And we sort of kicked our way through the snow down this broad street. Halfway to the um, east side of Manhattan, suddenly Stanley had disappeared. He, he was gone. And almost like Tom Hanks in the movie uh, Castaway, um, I was sort of ran around a bit and Stanley, Stanley, just like Tom Hanks was yelling, Wilson, Wilson. Well, I was looking for Stanley and there wasn't a crowd of people. Where did he go? I learned much later that he had commandeered a fellow in a pickup truck to drive him to Brooklyn. He just wanted to get off the island. I will tell you, not in confidence because it's 20 years later, Stanley was in a lot more shock than I was. So he was, he was acting in slightly strange ways in a, on a few occasions, this being one of them. So he, he disappeared from me. I kept walking. I got over to the east side of Manhattan, started walking north thinking, how am I going to get off this island? When I heard in the fog, in this winter's day, if you like, a bullhorn, next ferry is for Jersey City. I said, what? This can't be. I ran down Pier 11, a place I'd never been on the East River in, in the Southern Manhattan area. And I verified, I said, next ferry's for Jersey. Yeah, hurry up. I jumped on the ferry and they shut the doors behind me. We chugged south on the East River and around the tip of Manhattan and chugged toward in a Northwesterly direction toward Jersey City in Jersey. And as we got out of the fog, if you like, everything south of the World Trade Center was now foggy, cloudy, because the wind had been blowing from north to south that day, we broke suddenly into fresh air. And that was for the first time when anybody on the ferry boat realized that both towers were down. And it was surreal. It was like there was this hole in the sky. These buildings that had stood for so many years, what, 27 years, I guess, was it was just weird that they were gone. Um, I'm sorry, probably more than that, uh, 31 years, roughly. Um, being the last one on the ferry, I was the first one off. So they opened the doors and I ran down the dock into the ticket office and said, can I use your phone to the ticket lady? She said, sure, slid it across the desk. I picked up the phone, I dialed home and quite amazingly, I got through because statistically I should have got a busy signal because apparently at home, our phone just continued to ring off the hook. Remember that at 25 to 10, my wife had said, Brian will be out of the building in two hours. And our building collapsed 25 minutes later. So everyone in our house thought Brian was no longer with us on this earth. Um, and yet here I am at 11.15, an hour and 15 minutes after the building collapsed, 
calling home to say, you know, oblivious to any pain they're going through at home. I said, hi, honey, it's me. And my wife fainted, collapsed on the floor. I didn't talk to her. A friend picked it up and said, who's this? And, and I said, well, who's this? You know, what's a man doing in my house? So, you know, I, I was absolutely clueless. So he said, it's Dave. I said, oh, hi, Dave. He said, where are you? I said, I'm in Jersey City. Oh, thank God. He said, we'll come and get you. I said, they're not going to let they're not going to let traffic in here. I, I'll, I'm going to walk up to Hoboken and, and I'll get a train home. I'll, I'll, I'll see you soon. I said, somebody wants the phone behind me here. So I put down the phone and there's a line of 40 people wanting this phone. So lucky me, I got to the phone first. With hundreds of other people, I walked up to uh, Hoboken, took me 40 minutes. So at five minutes to noon, as I walked into the Hoboken train station, a public address system comes on at the 1130 train. Um, which had been delayed going to the station I wanted to go to, uh, has been delayed, will be boarding in five minutes. So they even held a train for me that day. I got on that train and we chugged north. It was a milk stop. You know, we, we stopped at every station. I'm used to express trains. So it was a longer ride that day. I understood that because they were accommodating everybody as best they could under those circumstances. Um, long story made short, and this is a long story, uh, I got home at about 1.15 as I pulled in the yard, you know, horn blaring, the house emptied. There was a big love, for, love fest on the front lawn. And I immediately began telling the story that I've just told all of you. And I think telling the story has actually helped heal me over these years. Um, the next part of my story, which I must tell you, happened one week later. Um, I fell into it exactly one week. It was on... Um, 9-11 was on a Tuesday, and early on the Tuesday morning of the following week, I was in a dream, in a very strange dream. The dream I had was that I was lying in my bed on my back. Now, for me, that's, a, I think, a very odd thing to dream. Um, in addition, I always sleep on my right side or my left side. I'm not a on-my-back sleeper. But in my dream, on my back, and my head came up off the pillow, and I looked at the foot of my bed, and to the foot of my bed came Jose Marrero. Now, Jose Marrero is the man I passed, Stanley and I passed, on the 68th floor walking up. And Jose was wearing this vivid, vivid dream, but he was wearing this bright white blousy shirt. I could only see it down to his hips because he was standing beyond my bed, at the foot of my bed. And with this radiant smile, now there's no tunnel of light, there's no, no flashing lights, nothing like that, but just this radiant smile and this bright white gown. And I pointed my finger at him, accusatory. And I said, Jose, you're alive. How did you do that? That's amazing, you fooled everybody. And I stared at him for another second and he didn't say anything. He just gave me this glorious smile and he leaned forward didn't say anything, but the message I absorbed was a very casual, you'll figure it out. And I closed my eyes and sort of shook the cobwebs in disbelief, and he's gone. But as I slowly woke up, I was on my back with my head up off the pillow. And I sat up in bed and looked around the room, still amazed, wondering, well, where, where did he go now? How did he do that? And then beep, 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 my alarm went off. And I realized now what had just happened, this visitation, if you like, that I'd experienced. And, and I sobered up and I realized that Jose's fine and, and all my coworkers are fine. And in the fullness of time, you and I will be fine. Um, and it was just this wonderful feeling. And, and ever since that moment, I've been able to tell my story without any emotion. Um, it's, it's, it rolls like a movie for me. It's a matter of fact, and I'm not worried, if you like, about the future. End of story. Can't hear you. You're muted. Undo it. There we go. <laughs> what a wonderful telling, Brian. That was phenomenal. Fabulous. Wonderful. Absolutely. Oh my goodness. Amazing. Thank you. Amazing. So and Stanley and I are still really good friends. <laughs>
Wow. Wow. That's amazing. All I can say, wow. Um, thank you, thank you so time. very much. Thank you for taking the time of sharing that wonderful story, Brian. Well, I, as I said at the beginning, you're welcome. Uh, uh, you know, I didn't have a near-death experience, and yet I experienced these oddities, these things I noticed at the time that I'm able to, to recount, you know, with, with, I hope, some clarity. And then this powerful dream just gave me all this assurance of, of, of the future, future. What I've learned in doing this meeting for, for all these years, I, we started in May 98, and I've talked to so many people and I've had my own experience. I've been to the other side. Um, but one of the things I've learned is that sometimes e extreme stress or, uh, or injury or pain even can cause people to have uh, the equivalent of a near-death experience. I mean, you were jolted from your normal reality into a, a different level of existence. Mm. And, uh, and uh, it's beautiful, just totally beautiful. Uh, what I've learned in doing this meeting for, for these years is that no one dies. That uh, a minute after you die, you feel exactly like you did a minute before you died, only you don't have a body. Your body is gone, but, but you yourself are the same and you feel the same and nobody dies. It, it's just the way it is. I like to tell a, a quick story inserted here and then I'll give, give you back the, 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 the mic as it were. Um, when I was in second grade, uh, I can remember looking at the third graders and they looked so much bigger and I'd, I'd pass their classroom and I'd see the the, the notes on the board and it looks so much harder than anything I you know the math problems and things I I didn't know how I was ever going to cope when I got to third grade it seemed to me like a really serious problem I, I don't think I can do this I said and those people those kids look so much bigger and and I, I just don't think I can do it but you know I got to third grade I remember thinking the first day I mean I'm sure my guides were we're pointing this up to me at the time because it's stuck with me as an enormous life lesson. When I got to third grade, the first day in third grade, I looked around and they were all the same size as me. And when we started our lessons, it was just picking up where we left off in second grade. It wasn't all so hard like it looked from second grade. And I learned that day and, and it stuck with me so vividly that you know, we're right where we're supposed to be. And, and when, when we're ready to die, it's the same. You look at, at people who are dead and who have gone on and you, you don't know for sure what's going to happen and it can be very frightening. And be, not knowing is one of the worst things. That's why I think this, this, these kind of messages are the most important thing the world can have to, to absorb because you learn that, you know, when you die, you're going to third grade. You're going to you're you're going to be right where you belong with with people who are the same size, and and people who are are just picking up the lessons that they left off with before they died, and it's not anything to be afraid of, and and this, I I just feel so blessed to have you, Brian. Thank you so much. You're an enormous gift to the world and keep telling your story and we will be posting this online and available for anybody and you're welcome to use the video any way that that you can we appreciate the um acknowledgement that it came from chicago ions but that's all it's uh otherwise everything is as free as can be we do have financial obligations and we request people that have enough money to please make a donation to Chicago Lions to keep us going. We, we support three, three little girls, or well, not little girls anymore, they're, they're young women now in Nepal for their education. And we pay $1,000 a year for that. And, um, and we have monthly expenses and we're, we're currently not meeting them. Fortunately, our guides saw that we had enough to, to keep us going for a while, but 
uh, but we do have these ongoing expenses. So we appreciate it that in anybody who has some money to donate, that they please donate what I call their fair share. If you have zero money, their fair share is zero. But if you have plenty of money, we request a $20 donation. So uh, thank you very much for those who contribute. At any rate, uh, if you have questions for Brian about his experience, I, I, it looks like the chat room is, <laughs> but I think he left us all speechless, Brian. <laughs> uh, what, a, what a wonderful gift. I, I would be interested to know um, um, how, uh, how you've changed since you've had this experience in the last 20 years. I, I know you've done some volunteer work. Uh, how else have you changed? Um, well, I, I, I am, I call myself a Christian and, and have certain beliefs. Um, I will tell you that my 9-11 experience confirmed to me or confirmed for me what I was believing. Up until that time before, I had doubts. I mean, Christianity is, you know, a, a faith-based religion it's an adult religion and so on and and i am i just became convinced that the beliefs i had are real and i should trust them um that's from a, a religious standpoint um from a more secular standpoint um the things that i took on afterwards were things like um there's no point in in wrestling with unanswerable questions. What if I had turned right instead of left? What if I hadn't felt that push on my shoulder? What if I'd gone to stairway C? Would it have been blown out? Would I, would I have survived? Well, we'll never know. I'll, I, I certainly won't ever know the answer to that question. So to waste any time trying to speculate is that it's a waste of time. You'll, you'll never find an answer because you can't prove it. Um, and so I spend no time on unanswerable questions and, and they can be things like, well, why did uncle Charlie, you know, get cancer and not aunt Susie? It, I mean, I don't know and you'll never know. So that's an unanswerable question. Don't waste time on unanswerable questions. And then if you look to the future, rather than the, those unanswerables from the past. If you look to the future, you can't predict that with any certainty at all. I went to work on a normal day and look what happened. Um, so to, to think you can predict the future is silly. The wonderful thing is that we humans are very good at adapting. You know, let, let's have a picnic next Sunday. Oh, it's pouring rain. Well, we'll move it indoors. You, you just adjust. You can't predict that rainstorm in advance, but but humans are amazing creatures in how they adapt to, to consequences in the future. So don't worry about it. You'll adapt. So don't, don't worry about the future. Don't waste time on unanswerable questions. Don't worry about the future. Well, if you take that attitude as, as I do, it leaves you very much in the present. You know, don't worry about the past, the waste time on the past. Don't worry about the future. Live in the present, do the best you can every day. And, and the world will be a happy place and, and a better place for you having lived in it. Yes, absolutely. Totally wonderful advice. We, we still have no questions. I can't believe it. Usually our- oh, there, there is one. At, uh, Sarah, here we go. Oh, you, you've got one? Well, Sarah, there's, Sarah there's tells me three. that- yeah. Pardon me? There's two or three questions there, Diane. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm just about to scroll oh, myself. Here. Coming up on my- Karen coming up on, oh, here's one, yes. Uh, I'm oh, sorry. okay, well, I start with Vicki's there. Have you spoken to Stanley since 9-11? And how has your life changed since 9-11? Well, uh, Stanley and I, as I said, are, are really good friends. We live, unfortunately, at least an hour and a half to two hours apart. He's on, on the dial. I live at 11 o'clock uh, compared to Manhattan and he lives at four o'clock. So we've got to go around or through Manhattan to, to get to each other's homes. Um, we've done a fair bit of documentary stuff together, interviews together, um, and so we see each other on those occasions. We have attended uh, weddings each, each way of, of our children. 
Um, he has spoken in our church. I've spoken in his church. And I remember one thing with Stanley on the first anniversary at his church, I was speaking and I surprised him with a gift. And the gift was the flashlight I used to find him. I put it in a shoe box and wrapped it in white tissue paper. And, and when I finished speaking, I presented it to him and you know he was happy to have it, that sort of thing. And about, oh gosh, eight years later, the museum called me and said, Brian, do you have any trinkets you'd like to put in the museum? I said, well, I really don't, but I, I can think of something. I'm gonna make a couple of phone calls here and I'll get back to you. And so I called Stanley and I said, do you remember on the first anniversary I gave you that flashlight? I said, is it under a bed or you know, down the cellar behind the furnace or something? He says, yeah, he said, I, do. I never look at it, but yeah, I've got it it's still in the same box. I said, and I told him the museum had called. I said, well, how about you and I go to the museum and give them the flashlight? He said, great idea. So we, we made arrangements to do that. And indeed the flashlight I used that day has its own uh, display case in the 9-11 Memorial Museum with the story written up about Stanley and me. Wonderful. So that's kind of fun. Um, how's my life changed? Well, I, I immediately I was put in charge of a relief fund for our, our victims' families. And uh, I'm happy to say that over the next five years, um, I was the, the, our relief fund was able to raise a little over $5 million for the 61 families that um, our company lost. We had 250 employees in New York and we lost 61 that day. And there were varying degrees of need within those families, uh, different ages, you know, some, some of our brokers were supporting their parents. Um, some of them were single, some of them were married with several children. So we had a committee that <laughs> analyzed, you know, what we thought were the the needs of each family. We looked after every family with regard to um, medical uh, assistance, or, you know, medical insurance and so on for those families and education for the kids. And, uh, and there were other distributions for other reasons as well. So that was, that was a good feeling. And I volunteered on a number of, of other volunteer boards um, that, that have kept me busy since retirement in 2006. And uh, what else do I do? Um, well, I play golf. <laughs> um, no, it's, you know, I, I do a lot of this sort of speaking stuff. Um, I, my favorites are, are with the kids in schools, be they anywhere from maybe seventh grade through high school. And what we do now, what we've, rather than me tell the story like I've told you, not that I minded doing that, um, I find a better solution for these kids is that um, there are some uh, videos, one in particular, when I was interviewed by a high school in Mesquite, Texas. Uh, they filmed me on the 10th anniversary and it was just one of those days when I said everything well and everything chronologically and I didn't forget anything and, it, and they recorded it and it ended up going on YouTube and I think it's had you know a, a million and a quarter hits at this point, um, and, and you can find it if you're interested or you have kids who would like to look at it because it's toned down a little bit for for kids. Uh, if you put Brian Clark Mesquite in in the YouTube search box, it'll pop up to the top of the list. How do you spell well, mesquite? How do you spell mesquite? M E S Q U I T E, like the like the spice or the seasoning. It's a suburb of Dallas, Mesquite, Texas. Okay, got it. So Brian Clark Mesquite in the, in the YouTube search box. It's about 40 minutes. You can skip the first four minutes. It's the high school social study teacher talking about the Civil War and other things that the US has been involved in from a, you know, a violence standpoint. Um, but it's the same story I told you today. But I think it's, it's a good one for kids. And the, what, so what we do with the schools now is I, rather than me tell the story and eat up 30 minutes, 40 minutes of their period, um, I asked the teacher, well, tell the kids to watch that video with their parents, preferably the night before. And then when they come back to school the next day, when I come on a Zoom call with them, they've seen the story, heard the story, 
and they can all have a chance to ask questions for the full period. Um, it also subtly gets the child to talk to their parents about that day because a lot of the parents now who were alive at the time, their kids weren't, but the, the parents were alive, maybe their children don't know what their story was on 9-11 because everybody has a 9-11 story, whether you were in uh, Ohio or Washington, DC, you know, well, obviously Washington DC has their story, but you know, or Seattle or wherever you were, you've got an experience that maybe your children don't know about. So it's a good sharing time. Uh, in, in that uh, vein, uh, uh, Sarah Feeberger, who's on our board, asked on the chat, she said, I was a facility manager for a life insurance company on 9-11. Our building was across the street from the Sears or the Willis Tower, it's called now, the, the, big, the biggest building here. The fear was that we were going to be hit next. The Chicago Loop was full of people trying to get out of the area. In the days that followed, our claims adjusters cried with those who filed death claims for the people who transitioned to spirit at the Twin Towers. Well, um, that wasn't a, a good time for anybody, Sarah. I hope you got through that all right yourself. Okay, Clara to everyone. At that time, did you affiliate yourself with any spiritual practice? I mean, I, I do. I didn't lie to Stanley. I attended church every, every Sunday. Um, the particular denomination my wife and I attend uh, is the Reformed Church in America. Um, there's a lot of Dutch heritage in the New York City area. If you'll recall, it was once New Amsterdam. So the Reformed Church, historically, I'm not Dutch at all, but the Reformed Church is associated with the Dutch, just like the Presbyterians with the Scottish and the Episcopalians with the English and Lutherans with Germans and so on. So um, are there support groups for 9-11 survivors? There, there certainly are those support groups. I'm not bragging. I don't mean anything, any disrespect at all. It's nothing I have felt that I've needed. I have made myself available to lots of people and they come to me and I talk to them and, and try and work with them through some things. That's kind of one of the volunteer things I've done over the years as well. But I'm not personally uh, part of a particular support group, either in the receiving end or the giving end. Um, how have your beliefs changed after 9-11? I, I think I spoke to that as well by saying that it's just really confirmed my beliefs. I'm just more certain of the things that I believe. I don't have any questions now. So, And Lynn says, hello, Brian, and thank you for your time. I'm curious to know, ah, there's a good question, how your wife's life has changed. Good question. And um, I can share that now that there was a period of time when I wouldn't, I just sort of avoid that. The truth is my wife was definitely in need of some counseling for two or three years to get through this because at five minutes to nine, uh, when I called her to say something's happened next door and then, you know, and it, two or three minutes later, boom, there's an explosion right where I've telephoned from. And then half an hour later, I'm alive again. And, and she says, I'll be out of the building in two hours. And 25 minutes later, I die again. And then an hour and 15 minutes later, I call her from Jersey City ticket box to her ticket office. And I'm alive again. In disbelief, she faints on the floor. So she had a very bad day. And it took her quite a while to get, get through it. That's certainly and she does not mind me sharing that these days. I, I didn't share it in the early days for respect for her. That's wonder, uh, wonderful that she's gotten through it and that she got yeah. the counseling and help she needed. Uh, and it's certainly understandable. I mean, what a, a jolt. It's like your brain, your emotions being electrocuted. Uh, um, but you survive and you have to go on. Eve, who is in, in the UK, said, you said there is no point to speculate trying to answer unanswerable questions, but what do you believe happened that day? How do you connect what your grandmother said to 9-11? Thank you so much. You are an amazing inspiration. 
Well, the what do I believe happened that day, I, I think other than the, the historical events, which I, I outlined that happened to me and that most people know the broader scope of what happened that day, what happened to me, I, I suppose I was, <laughs> I'll use this venue to say it, you know, maybe introduced more closely to, to another world that was trying to influence me, you know, the push on my shoulder, the somehow the, the parting of, the, of the, the smoke in that room to give me clear air. I mean, I, these are physical things that were happening. A couple of times I had that feeling wash over me. It, I, I think it happened three times. The, the, um, when, when the building righted itself after the, the sway left and right, um, this comfort feeling that, that I was okay. Um, I'm trying to think, the second time I guess was when Stanley and I got through the debris zone and Brian, you're going to be okay. Maybe there wasn't a third time when I had exactly that that feeling, but uh, those were interesting moments. I mean, it was a, a powerful internal feeling, not a not a strange voice telling me that. It was my own voice, but it was because I was somehow relieved of any tension that was that that possibly would have caused me to to freeze in in fear or just flee without any consideration for anybody else. I I felt like through the whole time I was. I was reacting to things that were in front of me, but not in a panic mode, if that makes sense. So it's beautiful, it's wonderful. I, I totally, I, I've had so many things like this. I went to Egypt on three days' notice, and I was guided in very similar ways to what you were describing. I had a voice in my room tell me to take my flute. I got on a plane and I was seated next to Marianne Williamson's personal fitness trainer. I didn't know who Marianne Williamson was and I got to Egypt and my roommate was Marianne's personal assistant and I ended up doing a, a, a service in the king's chamber of the great pyramid in the middle of the night in the middle of the week with Marianne Williamson uh, <laughs> I, 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 I still am just in awe of the things that have happened in my life that are the, this kind of miraculous nature and um, I was told by a, a, one, a famous psychic woman, her name is Greta Alexander. She was from Peoria, Illinois, and she was in a little book published called A, a, a Hundred uh, of America's Greatest Psychics, I think. And uh, I was guided to her and I had breakfast with her one morning and she told me, listen and trust listen and trust. This has become a mantra, mantra in my life to listen and trust. Mm -hmm. And I feel it's, it's uh, so very important. And once you do that, then that brings you to the here and now. When you listen and you trust, you no longer need to look backwards and no longer need to worry about the future because today is where it's at. This moment is where it's at. It's, uh, it's beautiful. Uh, Mary has a question for you well, too. Well, but we haven't left Eve's last question. She asks me also, how do you connect what your grandmother said to 9-11? Good catch, well, good catch. I, I've only connected that recently, uh, Eve. It's, um, it was always a, a, a bit of a mystery to me why that time with my, that moment with my grandmother happened. And it was just almost a secret, you know, that I kept to myself, really. Um, and it's only when I reflect back on the fact that I survived something like 9-11 with some new insights, perhaps, that I accept when she said, God bless you, Brian. She was giving me something that made me survive somehow, I suppose. I've always been a lucky duck. I, I, there's lots of things that have happened to me that I've somehow come through and, and escaped, be they academic or physical or you know sporting goods or what, whatever. Um, but that's a little different than surviving 9/11 in the fashion that I did. But I, I just you know I was blessed by my grandmother and 
can I say it's directly connected? No, but uh, I'll accept that the, the likelihood is that there's, you know, a causal effect there. So there's also uh, I've done I've, I've worked in hospice quite a bit, and uh, also I continue to work with people who are dying, and uh, a lot of death related issues. It's very frequent that people, even when they have severe uh, problems with their memory and so on and so forth, Alzheimer's, uh, before they pass, uh, they reconnect with, with the, their loved ones on earth for a moment. They sit up in bed and talk rationally, and then they lie down and go. So I think this was... Uh, One of those moments. It was also an, a, a sign of your grandmother's impending departure. Yeah. And she was, she was reaching out to you one last time, knowing that probably from, from a different perspective. So it's, it's a good thing. <laughs> um, Mary asked, what has been most challenging for you after the first couple of years after 9-11? Well, almost selfishly, the, the first couple of years were crazy with with interviews and 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 so on and people wanting wanting my time let's say um, when I had you know the relief fund to, to look after and and a normal job and and so on so but I was also given the gift that I wasn't spending any time in therapy or anything like that that I could I could deal with this. Um, was I really challenged? Interestingly enough, Mary, I'm not sure that I was overly taxed. In other words, it all it all worked out. Well, you're clearly an exceptional person. Uh, I I just recently re discovered within the last couple of years that I had a near death experience when I was born. I wonder if if you might not have had something like that as well. I don't know if there's anybody left who could tell you any more about details of your early childhood and birth. Some people even have near-death experiences before they're born, and it mm. changes who they who they are in, in the world. You look at things differently when you've had a near-death experience. There's no question about it. And the grandmother or my mammer, um, I I know it was unconditional love. She. My mother worked part time. It was this grandmother of mine that that really raised me, gave me my values. My wife is convinced that it was really my grandmother that raised me, mm -hmm. um, and she was a dear woman, and and she was always supportive. You know, making badges for my make believe clubs. Um, you know, helping me build a fort in the backyard and getting down mm -hmm. on the floor and pushing my dinky toy trucks around with me while we played, you know, when I was three years old, four years old, that sort of thing. Um, she was wonderful. So I, I lived a long life with her. She went to games and everything else. So she was special. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Wonderful. It appears, says Craig, it appears that your experience has helped you maintain a hopeful perspective on life. That's absolutely true. And I mentioned this because of all the tumult tumult that is occurring in our country and the world at large. Can you share more about coping with the world today? Well, I get asked this kind of question on, a, on occasion and in different, different type of um, scenarios, you know, unlike today, uh, like panel discussions and so on. Um, and uh, I just, my, my comment on that is shut up and listen. Um, it, it, we just need more and more dialogue and, and just internally in this country, you know, politics shouldn't be a contest. It shouldn't be to try and, and defeat the other side. It should be, what can we do together to, you know, make people's lives better? <laughs> that sort of, and, and internationally, you know, why are we trying to dominate economically? Um, let's work together and make the whole world a better place. It's just, it drives me crazy. So I don't know if I'm answering your question, Craig, but that's, that's what I think. More dialogue, more listening. Um, there we are. Yes. Thank I am you. sure your grandmother was with you all the way. That's probably true. I, I mean, 
can I know that for a fact? No, but yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll sure. accept that. So that's a good thing. Thank you very much, Clara. I see you smiling, Clara. <laughs> <laughs> do you know the number of survivors from the South Tower? I do know, Joy, that um, statistically, most, I shouldn't say most, because there were, there were a lot of deaths, but proportionately, many more people died in the North Tower than in the South Tower. Um, I mean, that's a, those are facts that, that are provable with company rosters and so on. And the reason for that is that in the North Tower, the 93rd floor and above, the, everybody's fate was sealed. Um, in the South Tower, based on the fact that next door got hit, a lot of people, including our employees, vacated. Um, they just headed for the stairs and the, you know, our building was secure, was the quote. And so the elevators were working and people got on elevators and left on elevators. So our building emptied much quicker than it did in 1993 with that bomb in the basement because nobody used the elevator then. It probably would have worked, but everybody sensed with the smoke and the air ducts and everything that elevators weren't a good thing to try. What was it that happened? Nobody knew, so you took to the stairs. When people knew that the next door building had been hit with something and it wasn't our build, people were comfortable or confident that they could use the elevators and get out. So our tower, the South Tower, evacuated to a great extent. What is sad is that more people didn't evacuate in that time period. I will tell you, we lost 61 people, at least 50 of whom were still on the 84th floor, including me, because I was a fire safety guy. I was trying to do my job. Um, a lot of people stayed on the floor. The brokers, because of the chaos in the market, they were staying on the phone to do business with their customers because interest rates were going crazy. So they were more interested in working for their customer than they were trying to save their own life. Not that they knew anything else was gonna happen. They just thought they were doing the right thing. Even though we were encouraging everybody to leave, saying it's okay if you leave. We were, in our training, we were taught, you don't grab people and move them. You know, it's their decision, but we were telling them to leave. But, um, you know, at, at least 50 people were killed when that right wing tip went through our training floor. I'm sorry that PMA Chatwater isn't here today because she is a, a gifted psychic who's had a number of near-death experiences and, and can travel out of body. And she, uh, she tells the story of how she went there when the, when the uh, towers collapsed and helped people out of the rubble, the, the souls that were coming out because people are confused and especially in this country because they don't realize that they don't die. And when they, when they uh, wake up and they're not in their bodies and, they're, and they don't know what to do, they're, they're very confused. And um, so a lot of uh, gifted people who have these abilities go to places like that of disaster and are there to help people coming out of the, the rubble and to help them help their souls find their way to the light. And um, she, she described a situation and she, first of all, she said that the people who died that day were, were people who volunteered to be a part of that, that the, that the, the whole um, happening uh, happened for a reason and, and that people volunteered to be a part of it. So if you were one of those volunteers, you did lose your life. If you were not, if you were people who, who had volunteered to do other things, you weren't a part of that. Um, but it, it's very interesting to hear her talk about it. And she's very gifted in these ways. She's written maybe 30 books. Mm. Her name is PH, PMA Chatwater. You might, you might find something about that in one of those, or if you would be interested in talking to her personally, I can give you uh, contact. So uh, uh, there's also another question or two here. Uh, there's, there's, there's two question, two questions that are somewhat related about 9-11 conspiracy, conspiracy theories. Right. Um, 
I, I don't give them any credence. Do I have proof? No, but I just know that some of the conspiracy stories talk about the government being involved. Some people go to the extreme, well, it never really happened, like the Holocaust never really happened. Well, obviously you can discount those thoughts. Um, with regard to, for instance, the government being involved and and anthra what is it anthracite? Is that the explosion that takes down building demolitions and so on? Uh, with regard to those sorts of, of things, I think if that were true, we would have had some leaks, some people saying, oh, it is all true. I was involved. There, there'd be some leakage. You couldn't keep that many people quiet if they were involved. I just cannot believe that. I, so with just that kind of false proof, if you like, I just don't feel like any of that holds water. I mean, we certainly saw the airplanes. They've been filmed. Um, and, and we know certain people got on those planes uh, from um, faraway countries and, and did what they did. They had airplane tickets and were sitting in certain seats and and died. Um, so I don't, I don't believe any of it, personally. Right. Good, good sir. Thank you. That's, that's, that's um, <laughs> thank you for that. Yes. You are welcome, Jane. Wow. We are so blessed. I, I, I'm just so grateful that you came. Thank you so much again and again and again. And hopefully someday we'll be be functioning back at Evanston Hospital, and and um, maybe you can come again in person, and and uh, we can take you out to dinner and have a good time. <laughs> well, thank you for the invitation. Thank you for all the good questions, and uh, I hope everybody has a a happy, happy holiday season. You too. Many blessings to you and to all of you, and we hope to see you uh, back here again next month. Uh, to welcome Adam Typo. And uh, if you don't know anything about him, look him up and, and uh, check out what he's doing because he's, uh, he's a good guy and he's doing good things. And um, I'm really uh, glad to make his acquaintance. So um, this is a good thing. Also, just a quick PS, I just received a phone call from David Young. I don't know if any of you remember David. David is a wonderful musician who's had a lot of spiritual experiences as well. He will be in Chicago in January and he's looking to, to put together some type of a group of meditation uh, for a, a documentary film that uh, I think it's maybe CBS or M NBC, somebody's doing a documentary and uh, he's, so watch for an email from me out. There will be an extra one. When I get all the details, we didn't have time to finish the conversation this morning, but uh, it, it's possible for any of you who might wanna be involved in that. So just, that was a PS. So we'll see you all next month, hopefully. And yes, have a very happy holiday season. And, Special, special thanks again, Brian, for being here with us today. My pleasure. You're welcome.